Two videos ago, we introduced the extended fin example. We use that as an application to apply the first two of the three steps in the numerical solution procedure. So step one was to obtain the governing equation that governs that particular physical system, which was a second order linear variable coefficient ordinary differential equation. And then step two was to discretize it using, in this case, the finite difference method in order to get a discretized version of the problem in the form of a linear system of algebraic equations. In the previous video, we looked at the formal basis for finite difference methods so we can see where these finite difference approximations come from. Now I want to take those finite difference approximations and apply them to extended fin examples so we can see how this process is done to complete that step two. So remember, the fin equation looks like this. d squared u dx squared plus f of x times du dx plus g of x times u is equal to zero. These f of x and g of x coefficients, they're known. They depend on the cross-sectional shape, surface area, and heat transfer properties in this particular problem. Then we have the boundary conditions. At the base, the temperature is u sub b, and at the tip, the temperature is u sub l. And so what we're gonna do now is to complete step two is to take this second derivative and this first derivative and use central difference approximations in order to obtain our system of equations. And we derived both of these in the previous video. So for d squared u dx squared, we have u at i plus one minus two ui plus ui minus one over delta x squared. For du dx, we have u of i plus one minus ui minus one over two delta x's. And remember the f sub i, g sub i, and u sub i, those are shorthand for f, g, and u evaluated at the point x sub i. Okay, so now we have the discretized version of our governing equation. We call this the finite difference equation. And it applies at each point x sub i, where i goes from 2 to capital I, all the interior points within the domain. We know the temperature at the endpoints, at the boundary values, so we're just applying this at the interior points. Now you notice some of these are repeated, so here's a ui plus 1, here's a ui plus 1. So let's gather together everything times ui plus 1, everything times ui, and everything times ui minus 1. When we do that, we get this expression here. Now I've also multiplied through by delta x squared for reasons that I'll discuss in a moment. So we have a coefficient times ui minus 1, plus a coefficient times ui, plus another coefficient times ui plus 1, and then the right-hand side coefficients, so a, b, c, and d. d, the right-hand side, is just zero in this case. a, everything times ui plus one is one minus delta x over two times f sub i. c is the same thing, but with a plus sign instead of a minus sign. And b is minus two plus delta x squared times g sub i. So we have our finite difference equation in this nice straightforward form. Once again, we're emphasizing here that we're going to apply this at every interior point. So we apply it at i is equal to 2, 3, 4, all the way up to capital I, where capital I, remember, is the number of subintervals that we're dividing up our full domain, the length of the fin, into. So that gives us a system of equations. In this case, the system of equations, which I've written out here, is tridiagonal. The only non-zero elements are along the main diagonal, upper diagonal and lower diagonal. Everywhere else we have zeros. And that's because of this structure. We have the point ui, the point to the right, and the point to the left. Now because the point is shifting, so this is the i is equal to 2 equation, 3, 4, and then this is capital I, and this is capital I minus 1. The unknowns you see here in the u vector, and then the right hand side vector we see here. Now you notice they're all just the d's, except for the first and the last one. In the first equation, if we go back and look at that, in the first equation, when i is equal to two, i minus one is one. u at x sub one, well that's that left boundary. We know the value there, that's u1. So it's d2 minus a2 times u1. Similarly, on the right side, when i is capital I, the next point to the right is capital I plus one. That's the right boundary. We know that value as well. That's U sub capital I plus one, U sub L. This is UB and this is U sub L. So I've taken all the known stuff over onto the right-hand side as we always do, and all the unknown stuff stays on the left. 
But what you see is we end up with a big system of linear algebraic equations, coefficient matrix times the solution vector of unknowns is equal to the known right-hand side vector. We know all the a's, b's, and c's. We know all the d's. So the only unknowns are the u's. Once again, not only is this a system of linear algebraic equations, it happens to be a tridiagonal system. Remember I said this when we introduced the finite difference methods. One of the advantages is we typically get sparse structured matrices. Sparse meaning there's lots of zeros, and structured meaning there is some structure to the matrix, in this case tridiagonal. So let me make a few comments on this, and then the next videos we'll talk about how to solve tridiagonal systems of equation using what's known as the Thomas algorithm. Now the first thing is when we write our finite difference equations, we'll put the unknowns on the left side of the equation and all the knowns on the right side of the equation. So you'll see that pattern throughout. Now the reason why I multiply through by the delta x squared, if you go back here, you'll notice this first term, all of these are going to be of the order of one over delta x squared. Remember, delta x is small, delta x squared is even smaller, so that when you divide by a small number, you get a big number. When we're using computers, we would like the numbers as much as possible to be order one sized. So by multiplying through by delta x squared, that gets rid of this, so all these coefficients are order one, and that's what we get here. So you can see one minus two, one, plus these small numbers, so the resulting a, b, and c are then order one size numbers. This isn't absolutely necessary, but it's just a good idea to be sure that as much as possible, the numbers that we put into our computer as inputs are order one, if at all possible. Now remember our discussion in an earlier video about round off errors and the effect of those round off errors. So the easiest thing to check here is for diagonal dominance. It's a tridiagonal system, so I just add up the a and the c coefficients in each row and be sure that they're no bigger than the b coefficients. And so that's a simple test for whether this is a well-conditioned or an ill-conditioned matrix to then try to solve. And that will give us some information about how likely we are to get accurate solutions for the u. In the next video, we're going to look at these tridiagonal systems of equations, how we solve them, some properties of them, and that'll give us a good basis for then taking the next step, step three, which is solving our linear system of algebraic equations to get the final numerical solution.